The law of God governs the entire universe. This is the same law that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob followed. This law was codified through Moses on Mount Sinai. Today, this law is all but forgotten in America. Discover how this law can bring you either blessings or curses. Learn how this perfect law of liberty can be followed today. This is the fourth study. Um, it's titled No Other Gods Before Me because it focuses mostly on the first commandment, but it kind of varies quite a bit. I'll do a quick outline of where we're going to go. We're going to start with No Other Gods Before Me. We're going to talk about what is a God. And then there's three titles that I have left to go over in this section called The Fear of God, Foreign Policy, and Obedience Slash Worship. Then we're going to go to the second commandment, No Graven Images, and we're going to talk about idolatry, public, that's a title I picked of God's law, what's to be public and what's not, and then appearance. And then finally, honor your father and mother. We're going to talk about family and education. As you can see, this goes over a lot of stuff already, and I'll explain why in a minute. Before we begin, I would like to start with this slide. You guys are probably getting sick and tired of it already. But we always need to remember the law of God is good for us. God clearly said that. It's for our good always that He might preserve us alive as it is at this day. If we don't understand it, that doesn't mean it's not good for us. It just means we're not quite at where God wants us to be. So uh, we also need to realize the law of God defines righteous living. It doesn't give us our righteousness, but it defines it. So it tells us how to live. So that's always important to remember, and I want to start with this every single time. The only way to understand God's law is to do God's law. One of my favorite verses, Psalms 111.10, says, A good understanding of all they that do His commandments. We have to start doing them, and as we learn them, we do more. And we learn more, we do more. We just keep trying and trying. Um, James said the same thing. He said, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. Deception is the opposite of understanding. So... Uh, they're saying the same thing, just kind of from the reverse angles. When studying the law of God, we err when we treat it as a religion. I think this is key. It is a law it needs to be studied as law, and I think this has helped me through this study more than anything. We need to remember that Israel was a nation, not a church. We need to compare Israel with other nations. The law of God is a national law. So we're not going to compare Israel to the church. We're going to compare Israel to America throughout this study and see what America's doing and how things work out there. And then finally, the law of God is compared to a mirror. James said that. And it should be used to look back at yourself and not towards others. I've been comparing this to the common law over and over again. And one of the, the, the way the common law works is based on damages. If you don't have a damage, you cannot take someone to court. So the way I look at this through the, the eyes of the scripture, the only time I should be worried about someone else's sin is when it causes harm to me. If someone else is doing something that doesn't cause me any harm, then why? I mean, they may need to grow in an area, but it shouldn't bother me that much. And that's a big problem we have in the church today. We seem to be focusing that mirror outward instead of at ourselves. And it should be our job to change who we are, not someone else. About eight years ago, I went through all the commandments and tried to organize them. This is what I came up with. There's 756 commandments, statutes, and judgments. I codified them into 87 titles of law. And all 87 titles fit under one or more of the Ten Commandments. Which, believe it or not, fit under the two great commandments, to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's just the way Jesus said to do it. That's the way our Messiah arranged it. Now, I always like to say this. This is not correct. I guarantee it. I've got duplicates in here. I would never get picky about that number. It's constantly changing, but it's a neat way to organize it to help understand it. You're going to see duplicate statutes because I couldn't figure out which title to put them under. 
um, today. I mean, they just, it, it's hard to figure out where they go. Um, maybe they're supposed to be in two different commandments. I don't know. But uh, just understand, I would never get picky on those numbers because it's constantly changing. But this is a neat way to understand it. I went this route because of what Jesus said in this verse. And um, it's been very helpful to understand. The first study, we went through faith and the law of the land. What we learned about faith right here is faith establishes the law. Without faith, there is no law for us. So we need to follow God's law by faith. We have to first believe in Him. Then the law of the land, that statute basically says we are to keep all of God's law as the base law of our country, of our nation. And America did that. Then the second study, we went through all the offerings. All the offerings are how the judicial system works. The third study, we went through the priesthood. Those are the judges in the judicial system. And this study, the reason why it's scattered all over the place, I'm filling in the gaps. Because I just didn't have room. I mean, we've still got a couple more to go over through you shall have no other gods. And there's very few on you shall make no graven images. And there's very few on honor your father and mother. So this is kind of a conglomeration of a lot of things. So if it's a little choppy, I apologize. But that's just that's the way it's going to be. Uh, there's no way around it. At least if I'm going to go this way. I didn't say this in one of the past ones, but this is split up in half. Love the Lord your God. You got five commandments on the, on the first half. Those five fit under love the Lord your God. And these five fit under love your neighbor as yourself. So the first five commandments are our dealing with God, and the second five are our dealing with each other, with people. That one there, honor your father and mother. If you've seen people try to organize this, some people go four and six, some go five and five. Your parents are your first God-given authority to connect you to God. But one thing I wanted to point out also, if you haven't noticed so far, those first three commandments, has anyone noticed how the entire, almost every commandment is about government? Everything we've been talking about going through the first three commandments is government. That, to me, that changed my perspective. I never looked at it that way. It's not so much personal. It's, it, it's national. It's government. It's how we're to live as a nation. At least the way I put things together, that's the way it lined up. And there are some things that are a little more on the personal side. In fact, today is going to transition on the, onto the personal side, which is part of the reason I was a little worried. I don't want it to be offensive. But, um, but it will be. Well, it, <laughs> hopefully not. We'll see. Might be. Okay, the Ten Commandments is a national law. God's constitution, that was the word Sava. Do you remember? The first word in Strong's is to constitute. God enjoined us with a law, with the Ten Commandments. God charged man with the law. You shall have no other gods is what we're going to talk about today. And there are three titles that we're looking at. Fear of God, obedience, and foreign policy. Oh, and war. Those are the, these are the commandments that we're going to talk about first. You can see there's 31 statutes on the war. It's going to take some time, but I'm going to try and go quickly through them. I apologize for that. Remember, through God, Israel would bless the nations. That's what the scripture said. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Israel was to be a light for the nations, or a light to the Gentiles. Their job was to spread God's word, spread God's law. They were the example this people have I formed for myself, they shall show forth my praises. That was their purpose. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. Israel was to show God's law to all the Gentile nations, which shall hear these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who has God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon for him, him for? And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? That's what Israel was supposed to represent to all the nations. We forget that sometimes. But Israel was the example. Okay, sometimes I think the church starts to worship Israel a little too much. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we don't focus on them to learn, but they had a lot of good and a lot of bad, and it's our job to learn from both sides and correct ourselves. According to Paul, they were to be a guide of the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, and a teacher of babes. So this even carries into the New Testament. Israel did not accomplish this. Well, they probably did a little bit, but they didn't do a very good job of it. 
The Gentile nations, Israel was their example. They were expected to follow God's law as well. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, Paul even mentioned they should be doing the law too. But Israel was held to a higher standard. They were held accountable for breaking God's law. For example, Sodom was punished for breaking God's law. That's hardly fair if they weren't under the law, right? If they weren't accountable to God's law. What about Gomorrah and the Amorites? God said the iniquity is not yet full. He was going to punish them eventually for breaking his law. Nineveh, same thing. All these Gentile nations were expected to follow God's law. In fact, in the future millennial kingdom, all the nations which came against Jerusalem will be expected to keep the Feast of Tabernacles and I'm sure follow all of God's law as well. This includes America. That's kind of my rationale for going this American route. America is supposed to follow God's law as well. And in the New Testament, the Messiah said, I am the light unto the world. Well, wasn't that Israel? Or is now that the Messiah? Paul and Barnabas have set thee to be a light unto the Gentiles. So the church's job now is to be a light unto the world. It's still with Israel whether you're grafted in or grafted out, but our job is to be a light unto the Gentiles, unto the world. So I want to review, we went over this on the first one, but Israel and America, do you remember how Israel started in slavery? But it was really bond servitude? Do you guys remember that in the first one? Mm -hmm. Okay, they, were, they had taskmasters. That taskmasters is the Hebrew word sar and mosmis, Sar is a head person, captain, or governor that's a ruler. Mosmus is a tax. A task master is a ruler who taxes you. That's the slavery Israel was in. America had the same thing. We had taskmasters before America was formed. Britain enacted legislation over the colonies. The Proclamation Act of 1763 forbade settlement. The Currency Act of 1764 regulated paper money. The Stamp Act of 1765 imposed a direct tax. Britain wanted the colonies submission. The problem was we were not free. God's law is the perfect law of liberty. That's where we're trying to go. So what happened? God exodused Israel out of Egypt. With a mighty hand, God brought Israel out of Egypt. Um, they used, he used ten plagues, remember? In America, God did the same thing. God worked in mighty ways to free America. At Brooklyn Heights, George Washington's troops escaped due to a heavy fog. Really? Was it a heavy fog? Just a heavy fog or was something else behind that? Dorchester Heights, a strong wind kept British troops from attacking. Battle of New Orleans, Andrew Jackson was outnumbered 10 to 1 but was still victorious. Okay, God was behind America's exodus from Britain because we were seeking the same thing, that perfect law of liberty. George Washington said this, and I'm quoting it again because it's an awesome quote. In his inaugural address, he said, No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Every step by which they have advanced to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. We ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. What do you think he meant by the eternal rules of order? He's referring to God's law. That's exactly how America was founded. We are almost an exact copy of Israel. In fact, if you study all the nations, the rise and fall of every nation is obedience to God, disobedience to God. And where is America at right now? That's kind of a scary spot. So what happened after the Exodus? God established a judicial system. God provided judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. This, in my opinion, is a neutral statement. It's not saying anything positive or negative. It's saying they had no king. Every man was free. Now, it's true. They went towards paganism fast because that's where our hearts go. But in the American colonies, you want to know what one of the number one slogans was? No king but Jesus. Amen. That's what they said. But they didn't mean it religious. They meant it really. They don't want a king. They just want the Lord. They want God to be ruling them. Which is what the time of the judges was. Remember? 
They tried to make Gideon a king, a king and he said, I will not rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. This is God's judicial system. This is his government, which is what the time of the judges showed us. In fact, in 1 Samuel, he say, the people said, give us a king to judge us, but it displeased the Lord. And he said, they have not rejected you, Samuel, they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. God was reigning over Israel during the time of the judges. It's true they sinned, and they didn't get it all right, but Israel during the time of the kings was a hundred times worse. So we need to keep that in perspective. America during the colonies is the same period of time as um, Israel during the judges. We had a judicial system, no king, people did right and wrong. And the judicial system handled everybody's business. And that's the way God designed it. That's the way it's supposed to be. So this is God's government. It's a judicial system. That's what Thomas Jefferson said. That government is best which governs the least because it's people discipline themselves. That's the time of the judges. God wants us to choose. Then they anointed a king. And this is the downfall of Israel and America. It brought oppression. Take your sons for war. Take your daughters for work. You know, the war, we call that a military draft. Take your land, that's eminent domain today. That's what the king does. Our president does that. Our government does that. And then finally, taxation. That's if you count that we're taxed when we get the money, we're taxed when we spend the money. We're taxed in every way possible. Die, <laughs> in every way. Yeah. We have taskmasters again. So we've come full circle. Um, the end result is slavery or national captivity. We watched Israel go there. America's heading there. I'm not trying to say we're going to be there soon or not. I have no idea. But that's the direction nations go. We rise and fall based on the obedience to God's law. So what changed? Have, you ever, have we ever wondered what changed? When you change your king, you change your law. I don't know if you guys recognize that, but every time we get a new president, we get a whole bunch of new laws passed. Israel changed their king in 1 Samuel 8, and God said, so then the manner of king, that so ran over them. And they got progressively worse and worse and worse. Every now and then there was a good one. And when you have a good one, that's great. But it's not always the case. America changed its king in 1776 when we inaugurated our first president. Now that wasn't bad. But it's just bound to get worse because we've, we've accepted a new law, the law of the king. Kings add to and take away from God's wall, but, law, but that's what God said not to do. He said, do not add to or diminish from it. Israel's kings change God's laws. And presidents write executive orders. This is what takes us from common law to admiralty law. Okay, this is where we've been going this whole time, and I've hinted at this a few times. But what takes us from common law to admiralty law, which is where we're at now, is presidents and Congress adding to and taking away from God's law. Black's Law Dictionary about the law of the land, lex terre is what it's called in Latin, says, The law of the land is the general law which hears before it condemns, which proceeds upon inquiry, and renders judgment only after trial. The meaning is that every citizen shall hold his life, liberty, property, and, immu and immunities under the protection of general rules which govern society. Everything which may pass under the form of an enactment is not the law of the land. Do you see the two different laws? We have the law of the land and then what we pass as an enactment. The law of the land is due process of law warranted by the Constitution, by the common law adopted by the Constitution. I'm going to quickly review what the common law is. This is the first ten dooms to the common law. Do not love other strange gods before me. Do not call out my name in idleness, for you are not guiltless with me if you call out my name in idleness. Mind that you hollow the rest day. You must work six days, but on the seventh you must rest. Honor your father and your mother. Do not slay. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not witness falsely. Do not unrighteously desire your neighbor's goods. And do not make gold or silver gods for yourself. You had to be a lawyer to know these things. Well, it, 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 it's simple, and it really frustrates me because Christians so many times try to prove that America was a godly nation, and they go outside of the law to secular writings of all of our founding fathers to prove it. And our law just clearly says it. The law dictionary say the common law is the law of the land. Our constitution says the common law is the law of the land, and that's the common law. And then if you look at all 48, we're not going to do that again, but number 11 is the land Sabbath. 
It's clearly the land Sabbath, seven, uh, uh, but the seventh he must be freely unbought. Six years he can be a slave, but the seventh he's freely unbought. Number twelve is the, the manner of daughters, giving a, a bride price and a dowry. And if you go through all 48, I did that on the first one, I just scrolled them up and I cited the scripture. It's almost word for word from the scripture. So the common law is the law of the land in America, and it is the Bible. It's the scripture. It's due process. Due process is law in its regular course of administration through courts of justice. You've heard me say this over and over again. But God's law, God's government is a judicial system. It's not a king, it's not a congress. Kings and congress, their number one job is to add to and take away from God's law. And that's what they do here in America, and that's what they've been doing ever since. God made an exception for a king, because a king, sometimes he can get it right, sometimes he's going to get it wrong. But just a judicial system construing the law without changing the law is what God wants. So God's law is a judicial system. Look at this, with the colonial courts acting as an arm of the church, in some instances, both the courts and the church handed out punishment. The church in colonial America was the government and they were the judicial system. We seem to forget that today. The church is a judicial system. The Encyclopedia Britannica said this about ecclesia. You guys know what ecclesia is, right? It's the Greek word for church in the New Testament. Ecclesia became coterminous with the body of male citizens 18 years of age or over and had final control over policy, including the right to hear appeals in the Halea, that's the public court, take part in the election of archons or chief magistrates, and confer special privileges on individuals. If you look at the word ecclesia everywhere but the Bible and Christian dictionaries, ecclesia meant judicial system. It meant government. In fact, we knew that 200 years ago. We separated church from state now, and we've lost sight of that. And now, you know, the church is what it is. I mean, th there's nothing better to do but get together as like-minded people and learn God's law and voluntarily be obedient. So there's nothing wrong with this, but the reality is we gave away all of our power when we asked for a king. That's what we did. The church in the wilderness was the congregation of the Lord. Do you remember last week what the difference between the congregation of Israel and the congregation of the Lord? The congregation of Israel meant all of Israel. The congregation of the Lord was the tabernacle and the priesthood in the judicial system. So when Stephen was talking in Acts, this is he that was in the church of the wilderness. He was talking about the congregation of the Lord, the church, the ecclesia. And finally, it's general laws. This is, we're still talking about the law of the land. It's general public laws binding on all members of the community. That's in contradistinction from partial or private laws. Do you see the difference between the general laws, the, the common law, and partial and private laws? There's two different legal systems on the planet, and that's it, you guys. There's the common law, there's God's law, there's the Torah, and, and then there's everything else that comes in in the form of an enactment. It's the people's law that we add to and take away from. It's been that way for thousands of years. It's not going to change. It's the same way it is today. Well, you're right. I should correct myself. <laughs> Hopefully soon. So like I said, this takes us from common law to admiralty law. That's what we've done. And that's why I said it was the downfall of Israel and the downfall of America. Once we allow people to add to and take away from God's law, this process always requires the people's consent. God said, choose ye this day whom you will serve. It's our choice. Look what our Declaration of Independence says, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Do you realize we consent to every legislation in America? And then we complain about it. But we consent to it first. We may not knowingly consent to it, but they have our consent. This is the process of moving from God's law, the common law, to contract law or admiralty law. I keep saying that, but it's important to understand that. The common law is run by a judicial system. Admiralty law is run by a king or a president. And all our law books say that. It's, it's just clear. So we have these two laws in America today. The first commandment says, You shall have no other gods before me. I am the Lord thy God is how we started out. This is the perfect law of liberty. It's freedom. The king's law is not freedom. God's law is freedom. It's liberty. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty? James said it's a mirror. That's what that law of liberty is. It's designed to reflect upon yourself, not others. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. In those days, there was no law of the king in Israel. Every man had the freedom to choose to do right or wrong. 
This is a neutral statement. Nowhere in the Hebrew where you think that it's condemning Israel. It's just a blanket statement throughout that book. That government is best which governs the least because its people discipline themselves. Now it's true. Just I can't think of a nation that didn't go towards the king and right into paganism and fall apart. We all do that. But what God wants is that time of the judges where we have him as our king and we choose to follow his laws or not and the judicial system construes that law in our life. This freedom comes from our judicial system. That's the Levitical priesthood. The common law protects all of our God-given rights. Now we have rights given to us from God. And then we have privileges given to us from our king, our president. That's the way the law distinguishes them. You've got the common law rights. You have Roman civil law privileges. Paul warned us about going to court before the unjust. Do you remember when he said that to the Corinthians? He said, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust? Did you know the common law has always been called a justice system? It seeks justice. It's like saying, go to law before the common law courts, not before the unjust. The admiralty law or the Roman civil law is called an adversarial system, which is why it says so-and-so versus U.S. So-and-so versus California. It's an adversarial system. The judge is a referee and he's just going to decide who wins the argument based on whatever contract or whatever the law is. This is why in courts you'll hear a judge say, I don't want to hear any of the Constitution in here. Because it doesn't apply. It's a different law we're, we're judging you by. And we get all upset like they did something wrong, but the judge made the right decision. It's our fault. We don't understand what's going on. Judge James Alger Fee, he said this in United States v. Johnson. This is one of those landmark cases. There's a lot of them that every believer should read. This is one of them. He says, the privilege against self-incrimination is neither accorded to the passive resistant nor to the person who is ignorant of his rights. You don't get your rights if you're ignorant. Nor to one indifferent thereto. It is a fighting clause. Its benefits can be uh, retained only by sustained combat. It cannot be claimed by attorney or solicitor. It is valid only when insisted upon by a belligerent claimant in person. If you want your common law rights, you got to defend yourself. You can't hire a lawyer. That's what he's saying. Can you see why we don't have our common law rights today? If you want your God-given rights, you have to go to common law courts. You have to represent yourself. You have to know your rights. Hosea 4.6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. What knowledge were they destroyed for? They've forgotten the law of their God. They've forgotten God's law. We should be able to go to court and know how to defend ourselves and keep practicing God's law. And that judicial system will side with you if you, if you defend yourself correctly. It'll happen every time and people do it. Okay, so what is a God? The Messiah said, you are gods. He said that in John 10, 34. And he was quoting Psalms 82, 6, where it says, I have said, you are gods. That's the word Elohim. That's God. Elohim is the Hebrew word for God. Here's Strong's Dictionary. It says, God's in the ordinary sense, but specifically used of the supreme God, occasionally applied to magistrates and judges. So that is, word is also used to refer to rulers. For example, in Exodus 22, uh, 8, the judges and the rulers of Israel were called Elohims. They were gods. In Judges 21, 6, same thing. Judges are Elohims, gods. Throughout the scripture, thou shalt not revile the gods nor curse the rulers of your people. These are f physical flesh and blood men being called gods. Pharaoh was considered a god. I'm sure you've heard that before. Caesar was considered a god. In fact, gods are basically the rulers of nations. Here's all the secular rulers throughout history. There's a lot more than this that were called gods. The Egyptian pharaohs, Chinese emperors, Roman emperors, Japanese emperors. There are dozens. Almost every nation, their rulers were called gods. So there was an original Caesar, and then there was a succession of Caesars after him, and they were all called gods. So that office was called a god. The conclusion I've come to is this. All gods are sovereigns. That means they have authority over their jurisdiction. So the kings have provinces that they rule over. Governors that were over every province. Rulers of every people of every province. So the second one, uh, all gods write laws. They have authority because they make the laws. 
So Nebuchadnezzar commanded the people. King Ahasuerus, his scribes called 13 days of the first month every province and he sealed it with the king's ring. He wrote a law. And in every province, king's commandments and his decrees, all over the scripture we see that gods are sovereigns and they write laws and they're real people. Now there's an office and a succession every single time, but they're real people. They are your protectors in whom you trust, their rock in whom they have trusted. So these kings are the people, they're, they're trusting that person over God. Who are today's gods? Well, California is a sovereign and has a legislature. I don't know if you ever looked at it that way, but we're doing the exact same thing. We have a sovereign state of California, and we have a succession of people ruling in that position. The United States is a sovereign and has a legislature. And we're doing the same thing. Those are the gods. Today's gods are still the rulers of nations. We've turned them into mythical things. Because we're studying them from thousands of years ago. The reality is we need to look at what's going on today and realize that we have gods in America and some of them are okay, some of them aren't. You shall have no other gods before me. The fear of God. There's nine statutes, at least nine that I found. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me is what the commandment says. In Strong's, the word before is al. That means above, over, upon, or against. Here's how I understand this. You can have other gods just not above the God of the Scriptures. And God okayed that in 1 Samuel 8. King David was a God that submitted to the God of, of the universe. He was okay. Several of Israel's gods submitted to the God of the universe. And that was okay because they didn't change our law. But several gods or kings don't follow God's law. And that's where this is a problem. So we need to understand this just as it's written. We can't have any gods before the God of the Scriptures. You shall fear and reverence God. Okay? Fear is the Hebrew word yare, which means to fear morally, to revere. I think this word reverence is both fear as in trembling and being afraid, as, as well as reverence. So we're to hold God in great respect, and we're supposed to fear Him as well. Uh, why should we fear the Lord? The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him. The fear of the Lord produces obedience. Uh, it does. I know, that, I know that with my kids, when they're afraid of me, when they have a healthy fear of me, they, they're obedient. And we're supposed to be the same way. Uh, so great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's said several times in the Scripture. He will fulfill the desires of them that fear Him. Probably because if you fear Him, you're going to want His will. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So fearing the Lord means we're going to hate breaking His law, hate evil. The fear of the Lord prolongs days. And the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. And the fear of the Lord is for our good. So that's why we're to fear God. Because everything about it produces in our lives good things. You shall not fear a reverence man. This is the opposite. If we fear man, where are we putting God? We're putting him a step below man. So we need to put God's commandments in him first. Ye shall fear every man his father and mother. Now we are to fear our parents. Why? Because they're that first God-given authority. And Jesus even confirmed it when he said, Fear not them which kill the body. But we are to fear God because he can not only kill our body, but throw ourselves into hell. You shall know that God is one and love him with all that you have. That's the Shema and the first commandment. In fact, Jesus quoted that when he said, This is the first of the great commandments, that we shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. In Strong's Dictionary, one Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, is united, that is one. God is both united and first. Love is a hob. It's agapeo in Greek, to love, to have affection for. John says love means to keep the commandments. So to love God and put Him first means to obey His commandments. Them that love me and keep my commandments. That's where John got it from. He said over and over in his uh, epistles, 
To love God and keep His commandments. To love God and keep His commandments. You go to the Torah, it says over and over again, God says, them that love me and keep my commandments. That's exactly where John was getting it from. Uh, you shall not profane God's name. Strong's Dictionary, Yahweh is His name. It means self-existent or eternal. There are no vowels that we know of. We have no idea how to pronounce His name today, which is very unfortunate. This name, though, is a description of who He is. He's the self-existent or eternal one. Profane is the Hebrew word kalal, which means to wound, to dissolve, to break one's word. This means we are not to dissolve the covenant or break one's word by breaking the covenant. If we're going to jump into agreement with God, we need to be serious about it. You shall keep God's laws forever. And I'm not going to go through this again, but the first one I scrolled through all the times in the Torah, it says it. And it takes about two minutes to go through them all. But over and over and over again, God says, keep my commandments, keep my commandments. And He adds the word forever. So it's very important that we keep His commandments forever. We always got to remember, it's not gone. It hasn't been abolished. But I'm just going to click past that because you've already seen that. Uh, you shall not tempt God as they did in Mahara when they tested God for not having water. Uh, number eight says, God will be faithful to those that love Him and keep His commandments. He's always faithful. And God will discipline you if you do not keep His laws. So it's a father-son relationship. The fear of God always leads to obedience. Obedience and worship. Notice how I put obedience and worship together. We think of them differently today. Very differently. The scripture really doesn't. Strong's Dictionary, obedience is shama, which means to hear intel in intelligently, often with implication of attendance, obedience. I think that's sh shama, or I'm probably saying it wrong. But it's the common word that I always say. But it means obedience. Uh, worship is, I'm going to get my Hebrew wrong, but shaka, yeah, which means to depress, that is prostrate. It means to bow reflexively in homage to, uh, to royalty or to God. This was a symbol to acknowledge allegiance. We do this today. People still do this today. Here's some examples. In the scripture, they would bow before their royalty. Today, we bow, sometimes kiss the ring of royalty. We salute, letting people know that they're, they're our authority. We salute even as kids and Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, things like that. And we even say the pledge. This is showing where our allegiance is. Who's our authority? That, that's just the way it is. So when you look at obedience and worship, they're really saying the same thing. When I was trying to put the statutes together, they were the same thing. They were just, so I just combined them. Uh, you shall obey the voice of the Lord your God. If you walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice, we're to obey the Lord your God. You shall walk in the laws, commandments, statutes, and judgments of the Lord. This is the law of the land. Disobedience to God causes natural penalties. And your allegiance, worship, is only for God. Worship is a physical manifestation of allegiance. So when you bow down, or when you salute, or you do any of those signs, the scripture has a few of them, we have a lot more today, you're showing allegiance, you're showing who you're obedient to. Foreign policy has nine statutes, at least nine that I found. We need to recognize stranger, and I mentioned this last week, stranger has three Hebrew words. The first one's ger, the second one's zur, and the third one's nakar. This is very unfortunate because we mix up what these mean all the time. The first one is a positive one. It's a guest. It's a stranger in the land who voluntarily wants to follow Yahweh and all of His commandments. The second two are not. Zur is a profane stranger, someone who rejects God's law and following His commandments. And nakar is a heathen stranger, someone who rejects God's law. So as we're looking at these, we need to remember that. You shall not mistreat a stranger. That's a gear. That's someone who's in the land and who follows God's law. Someone who's obedient to God. Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him. You shall love the foreigner. Why? For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. That's pretty telling, I think. Both these strangers are gear. So when Israel was in the land of Egypt, they were there as a guest. Which, it wasn't slavery like we're thinking of. It was a taskmaster, a ruler who taxes you a lot like we are in America today. You shall not contract with foreign nations. This is called a treaty today. 
Treaty is an agreement, league, or contract between two or more nations or sovereigns. So we have nations today and that's what a treaty is. Treaties diminish the sovereignty of nations and treaties diminish the rights of the people. It's another way of adding to and taking away from God's law because the treaty takes precedence over the law of the land. You shall not allow foreigners who practice pagan laws to live in your land. Which word is that? That's not care. That's the other strangers. So can you imagine if we had immigration policy like that? Immigration is a big part of America. What the scripture is saying is we should have open borders to all who obey God and keep His commandments. Those who don't cannot immigrate to America. I, I think that's the best policy we can have. That would solve a lot of our problems. Yeah. Wow. You may not meddle in the affairs of foreign nations. You can only buy and sell with them. So if we're going to deal with a foreign nation, we're not supposed to deal or worry about what they're doing. God's going to judge them. But if we need to buy or sell for business purposes, that's okay. Ambassadors can be sent to foreign nations to convey messages. Moses did that throughout the scripture. They sent ambassadors to deal with people from foreign nations. Uh, seer is the word for ambassador. It's a herald or or Aaron Dewar, and Malak is a word for messenger. These are both ways for one sovereign to go uh, to speak to another. It's a public officer closed it with high diplomatic powers commissioned by a sovereign prince or state to transact the international business of his government at the court of the country to which he is sent. You shall not marry with foreigners who do not practice God's law. A lot of people take this as racial discrimination. I don't know why they do, but they, I don't think they've studied it correctly. But this is not racial discrimination. Solomon loved many strange women. Which stranger is that? It's not care. It's not care. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's Nakar, I think it is. It's the heathen one, the one that worshipped a different god. Why? Because his wives would turn his, uh, away his heart after other gods. That's the whole point to that. Uh, the, another commandment says that you shall not let your sons take of their daughters unto thy sons and make thy sons go a-whoring after other gods. This stranger is the same thing. It's Nakar. It's, it's not the good one. The New Testament calls it being unequally yoked. This is the same law. We don't always see it, but the New Testament is confirming the same law. Where to find someone to marry that obeys God and keeps His commandments. After all, one law shall be to him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourns. If there's not one law in your marriage, you shouldn't be married. So this is not racial discrimination. You can marry any race as long as they obey God and keep His commandments. But you'll be surprised how many people go out there and take verses like this and say you can't marry someone of a different race. You can lend to foreign nations but not borrow. God's plan was for us to be the lender, not the borrower. Because the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. You may apply usury and interest to foreigners, but you can't do that to... We're going to talk more about usury and interest in like two lessons. But um, we can lend to a stranger, a foreigner, to make money off of them. But we really can't do that to our brethren. Or to lend to our brethren. That's the gist of it, in my opinion. We can lend to our brethren to help them out in need. But we can lend to a foreigner or a stranger to make money off them. And for, so one's business, one's in need. There's 31 war statutes that I put under. You shall have no other gods before me. We are to go to war, but by the will of God only. Okay? America doesn't always do that anymore, but we used to. God will go to battle before you. So the Lord thy God is with you. For the Lord your God is he that goes with you to fight for you against your enemies. We probably all knew that. You shall always proclaim peace before battle. So that's the intent behind all this, is that we proclaim peace and that there's peace instead of a war. Enemies that surrender peaceably shall be put under tribute and spared. That's where Israel was before the Exodus. They were under tribute. That's where America was before we came to America. We were under tribute. Foreign nations who do not make peace are to be totally destroyed. God shows no mercy. If it's their time for judgment, God uses nations to judge other nations, and it's over. So if they don't make peace, if they don't repent, is another way to, to put it, then we are to completely destroy them. You shall besiege a city that does not want peace. So this is kind of a war strategy. 
Um, to besiege someone is to cramp, that is to confine. We would use the word siege today. It's a military blockade of a city or fortified place to compel it to surrender. So you'd surround it and make sure that it can't get out, you know, maybe control their food supplies and water supplies. You shall build defensive walls against the cities you besiege. The King James called them bulwarks. We're supposed to build wooden walls around them. That really doesn't apply today, but whatever we can do to contain them with modern technology, you wouldn't really build a wooden wall. That's not going to stop any nation today. You shall not destroy fruit trees during a siege. So when you're building this wall, you're not supposed to destroy the fruit trees. I would guess it's probably because that's food for your army. I mean, why would you destroy them? You should use the trees that don't produce food. Uh, we must build the wall with non-fruit bearing trees and I'm guessing that's probably the reason. Only males 20 years or older can serve in the military. We got that close, we're two years off. We allow 18 years. Only able-bodied males can go to war. We actually do that one. If you're injured, if you have a disability, you're not going to war. You're not a part of the army. The Levites and judiciary are not eligible for military service. We do that too. Our judges and our rulers, they don't go to war. There's a good reason for that. They have to make tough decisions. They need to be able to do this. And these, the next three are my, some of my favorites. Men who have been married less than one year are exempt from war. Men who have built a new house uh, not dedicated are exempt from war. And men who have planted crops but have not yet reaped are exempt from war. This is building a family. God has great respect for family, marriage, building a home, and making a living. If a man's in the process of building a family and establishing his home and getting up on his feet, God has respect for that. I think that's really cool. Why make him drop everything and go to war for three, four, or five years, whatever it is, and all his work is gone? This makes perfect sense, especially being a family guy. This makes perfect sense. It's almost like God knew what he was doing. <laughs> Those that are fearful of battle or are faint-hearted are exempt from war. Look at the reason. Lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. Fear is contagious. Those who are fearful will hinder the army. So if someone's afraid, he didn't do that for that person, but that's going to destroy the morale of your military. I got a question. Yes. Do we do that today as far as if you're fearful? No. No, yeah, that's an interesting question. You know our military draft, it's not man mandatory. It's no. mandatory to report. Yeah. But there are several people, If you, you, you have to show up. There are several people that when they administered the oath, said, hold on a second. And then they said, I would not like to do this, or am I waiving any of my rights? And then what do they do? They take them off, talk to them for a couple hours, and let them go. What makes you a soldier is the oath and the signature. Mm. Okay. That's what makes you a soldier. The reporting, you have to show up. There's no yeah. doubt about it. But if you don't take the oath, you're free to go. And there are several people that have done that and have shared that story. So it's never been mandatory. Um, so I would say that kind of falls under that. Mark, did you have a question? Well, I mean, and also, it's, it's not just fear, <laughs> but the volunteer is the best thing we've ever done because... You have guys in there, you know, I was in charge of a whole unit with guys who just didn't want to be in the military. And it's better to just get them to the side, get them out of the yeah. military, and let everybody else who wants to be there work and do their job and stuff. It's, going, it's only going to ruin the morale of the military. That's all it's going to do. So there, there's really no good that can come out of it if you force someone to go to military. I agree. You shall establish a military chain of command. We do that today. We have officers over thousands and hundreds. You shall appoint a priest to speak with the soldiers during, during war. We kind of do that, don't we? Don't we have chaplains yeah. in our military? When you go to war, you shall blow the trumpet as an alarm. We still have trumpeting in our military to this day. It traces all the way back to the scriptures. In fact, we're a little more advanced with a civil defense siren. We have sirens that will let people know. Because remember, this is when you go to war in your land. So this is sound the alarm. Let everybody know. Look out. Someone's coming. You may use spies against the enemy in war. We're constantly spying today. It's at a whole new level with technology. You shall not be afraid of strong enemies during war. That's just undermining God's authority when we do that. You shall not panic or retreat during battle. Same thing. It's undermining God's authority. If he's really going before you, what's to be afraid of? 
you shall abstain from every evil thing when at war. If you think about that one, if you're going to war and God's fighting for you and you're in the middle of sin, where's God going to go? He's leaving. Cleanliness in the camp is to be maintained. I find it pretty interesting that God expects you to keep the clean and unclean laws even in the camp. You might as well have healthy soldiers. All males of defeated nations are to be killed. Those that fight in war against you, you kill them. You don't let them. It, they had their chance for peace. Now it, it, it's all or nothing. War may be brought on by God as punishment for national sins. So if you're getting war, it, that might mean God's... It doesn't necessarily mean God's fighting for you. All right, War could be a, a punishment. Prisoners and goods are to be taken as spoil from defeated nations. And the spoils of war are to be divided between soldiers and government. I don't think we're doing that. Do the soldiers get any of the spoils of war? I didn't think we did that. Well, sometimes they do, but not... Not, 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 not intentional. Not, yeah. not legally. <laughs> not legally, yeah. You shall not take pagan artifacts as spoil. So you shall not take the accursed thing. Because God says the devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. That word for devoted and the word for accursed is the exact same word. Um, I'm going to guess at that right now. Cherim is usually a doomed object or a dedicated thing. The way I look at this, if you're going to war and you take something that was dedicated to another god, or in, it's probably a contract with them of some sort, who knows? You're not allowed to have it. You don't want any of those pagan artifacts. That's the way I see a pagan art. And it's with another ruler, not some mystical god up in the sky that we've made up. It's with another ruler. You may marry a captive woman. So when you go to war, you can have her to wife, and thou shalt bring her home to your house. If you marry a captive woman, you must shave her head, pare her nails, and remove her captivity clothing. Now that's kind of odd. Um, I'm guessing this is probably to remove any resemblance to her former nation. She is now an Israelite and needs to look and act like one. If you're marrying someone that you've just conquered, they're not allowed in Israel unless they're following God's commandments. We already saw what his immigration policy was. Okay, that person's now becoming an Israelite. Yeah, it's, so who knows what their hair was like? Who knows how? The, but God, it's like God saying, "Give a fresh start." Now maybe I'm wrong, yeah. but that's my guess on it. Well, in the military, the first thing you do is cut off people's hair because you don't want their individuality and stuff. Right. They become all the same. You try right. to look at yeah. 50 people, bald heads. Yeah, it's really hard to tell. <laughs> it, it fits in a little bit with the way I was describing it. It's remove their identity. Remove that identity, and they're taking on a new identity. So that, that's probably the best guess. The captive must, uh, woman must be set free if you divorce her. So, and it shall be if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whither she will, for thou shalt not sell her at all for money. So for some reason, if they're, if they're not happy with the marriage, she's free. Okay, we're going to move on to the second commandment, and this is where I need to apologize up front. Um, some of this is a little different thinking. I know what we went through was kind of tedious and long, and I, I, I told you up front, we're going to go through every commandment that I could find, and it gets a little tedious at times. But this part coming up in the next couple of slides, I was worried about, I, I shared it at the Feast of Tabernacles a couple of years ago, and I didn't sleep one minute the night before, because I was just nervous about it. So what I'll do is give you guys a complete way out. You don't have to believe anything I'm saying. There's two things you just need to remember. Okay, if you remember these two things, you know what I'm saying could be wrong. Blonde hair, PE teacher. Probably wrong. Okay? If you remember those two things, just ignore what I'm saying. We're going to talk about idolatry, public, and appearance. Okay, you shall not make any graven images. Okay, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. So what's a graven image? Well, there's three things that, talk, that the scripture talks about. An idol, a graven image, or a standing image. Okay, an idol basically means vain or vanity. It's useless. It's not real. It's fake. A graven image is an idol or a carved thing. Something carved and engraved. And a standing image is something stationed, a column or memorial stone. It's an idol, a standing image, or a pillar. 
These images represent something or someone. Okay, a statue could be a graven image. A plaque could be a graven image. In fact, some of these plaques were placed on pillars. What these did was designate a jurisdiction from a sovereign. That's what they did. In fact, um, there's historical writings where they talk about Rome putting these kind of plaques on Israelite cities and they got upset. I mean, it really bothered them because they knew what it meant. Rome was saying, we are your authority. So are monuments? That's where I'm getting to. The real purpose of the second commandment has nothing to do with the images, for even God commanded that we make images. He told us to put two cherubims on the Ark of the Covenant. So it's not the image per se. Solomon used two pillars in the temple called Jachin and Boaz. He even gave them names. God is not concerned about the images of his own creation. Rather, he is concerned about whom we serve. There's a big difference here. I have two statues of Labrador Retriever dogs at my house because we love labs, we breed them. But that's not a graven image to me. There's, there's images we have, that's not what the scripture's talking about. Nebuchadnezzar made an image of himself and he said to worship, to bow down to the image. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew exactly what he meant. He said, we will not serve your gods. So it's not the act of bowing down per se or the image itself, it's the serving of the God. Graven images are served. This means a contract is involved. Confounded be all they that serve graven images. So you serve a graven image. That sounds kind of foreign to us today, but we do it every day. Thou shalt make no covenant with them nor their gods. How do you make a contract with a graven image? How do you make a contract with a god that doesn't exist? Just this myth. It's a real person we make a contract with. The Bible calls this a master-servant relationship. Today, we would call it a guardian-ward relationship. Okay, A guardian is a person lawfully invested with the power and charged with the duty of taking care of the person and managing the property and rights of another person. A ward is the person over whom or over whose property a guardian is appointed. This is the modern terms for master-servant in, in, in our modern law. We talk about guardianship all the time. God is our guardian. He's our ruler. He's the one we've submitted to, right? We've created a guardian ward relationship. That's what the covenants are doing. How do these relate to graven images? Here's what a graven image today is, you guys. We call idolatry the wrong word. We've turned idolatry into a religious thing. The word that should be translated idolatry in our scripture is called corporation. Hale versus Hinkle, the Supreme Court case, is one of those landmark cases everybody should read. This is what a corporation is, okay? A corporation is a creature of the state. The state is sovereign over the corporation. The corporation is incorporated for the benefit of the public. A corporation is a state franchise. Incorporation is a state privilege. A corporation is subject to the laws of the state. Its powers are limited by law. It must obey the laws of its creation. And a corporation has no constitutionally protected rights. When you incorporate, you leave the common law and you go to the civil law. Remember what we've been talking about? This is what I've been trying to build up to. It's a cre it, it even uses the word sovereign. You have a new sovereign when you incorporate. A corporate charter. It has a graven image right on it. They're even bumped and raised up. They stamp them to show jurisdiction and to show who the master and who the servant is. Corporate charter, we call it a state seal. It's a graven image today. Statues, we put statues around with these uh, state seals on to show a jurisdiction. In Jeremiah 10, many people say this is the Christmas chapter, but it has nothing to do with Christmas. He says, learn not the way of the heathen, for the customs of the people are vain, for one cuts a tree out of the forest. The work of the hand, the workman with the axe. Alright, so they cut a tree out of the forest and they carve it and they engrave it. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. So it's a fastened thing that does not move. They are upright as the palm tree, but they speak not. So it, it's like a person. It represents a person, but it doesn't speak. They must needs be born. I love the King James. 
They're not born. They're not real is what he's saying. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Okay, do you see what he's saying? This is not a Christmas tree. It's a doctrine of vanity. It's an idol. It's vain. It's not real. The work of cunning men. The next verse, or a few verses later, says it's a graven image. They are vanity. This is an idol. Okay, what this is, is an artificial person. It's a fake person that represents someone. The definition of a corporation, the very first word, is an artificial person or being endowed by law with the capacity of perpetual succession consisting either of a single individual termed a corporation soul. This is a fake person. It's not real. Or of a collection of several individuals which is termed a corporation aggregate. Okay? Corporation is the modern term that we should be calling idolatry. Graven images. That's the state seal. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. The likeness of heaven, every single one of them has this. The likeness of earth, the likeness from water, you bow down to them and you serve them by contract. When you get a corporate charter, you are making them the guardian and you're, you're the, you the ward. And our law just straight out says that. There's no doubt about it. All gods have their own graven images. Our president has a graven image. The vice president have a, has a graven image. The governor has a graven image. Even our mayors have graven images. These are the rulers. Those are the gods of America. They even have the likeness of heaven, earth, and water on every single one. It, it, it's, it's like Satan's taunting us by just showing us exactly what it is, but we don't want to see it. President Thomas Jefferson said this, If American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their money, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of their property until their children will wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Can you see us going in that direction? That's not happening. It's not? <laughs> I must be wrong. He was way off. Abraham Lincoln said, said, as a result of war, corporations have been enthroned. Does it sound like idolatry yet? And an era of corruption in high places will follow. And the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until all wealth is, wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. What destroys our republic? Corporations do. I feel at this moment more anxiety for the safety of my country than ever before. Even in the midst of war, God grant that my suspicions may prove groundless. I don't know. Can you imagine what he would think of? <laughs> it scares me. And then uh, President Grover Cleveland said, As we view the achievements of aggregated cap capital, we discover the existence of trusts, combinations, and monopolies. While the citizen is struggling far in the rear or is trampled beneath an iron heel, corporations, which should be the carefully restrained creatures of the law and the servants of the people, are fast becoming the people's masters. Do you see the terminology they're using for it? If you Googled this topic, Founding Fathers and Corporations, you get hundreds of quotes just like this. Warning us, don't go this route. They banned corporations in colonial America. And they seriously regulated them early on after our president was in inaugurated. And then things changed. So idolatry, there's ten statutes. You shall not make any graven images. That's a state seal, you guys. You shall burn all graven images when you conquer a land. You need to get rid of them. We, those are, that means get rid of all these contracts that we signed. You shall burn a city that is turned to idol worship. So if there's a city that wants to go serve other gods, this is how serious we're supposed to take this stuff, you guys. We're supposed to stop it immediately. You shall not bring a graven image into your house. I don't think that's talking about my Labrador retrievers. I think it's talking about me taking on that corporation identity. You shall make no mention of the name of foreign gods. That's what we do. 
With, with, that's all we're doing when we're stamping these things. This, this, is, this has the state seal right on it. We're using its name. You shall not let foreigners who worship pagan gods dwell in your land. You shall not follow others to idolatry. So we're not supposed to follow the example of others. You shall not identify in any way with the idolater. So we're not to consent to them, nor hearken to them, pity them, spare them, or conceal them. We're, we're just supposed to avoid it. The death penalty is to be given for idolatry. And national captivity is the punishment for national idolatry. Yeah, we are. Okay, so a graven image. The Lord shall scatter you amongst the nations for graven images. Okay, so the punishments for nine. Personal idolatry is the death penalty when a person signs up to serve another god or ruler. National idolatry is national captivity when the nation signs up to serve another god or ruler. Has America started national idolatry yet? The United States of America, this is John Bovier's Law Dictionary. The United States of America is a corporation. I don't know if you knew that. We're not really a country. We're a corporation. It's a business. The United States of America, under Corpus Juris Secundum, that's uh, one of the leading law encyclopedias, it's a foreign, a foreign corporation is one that derives its existence solely from the laws of another state, government, or country. They have down at the bottom it says, the United States government is a foreign corporation. Title 28 of the U.S. Code, under their definitions, they just straight out say it. The United States means what? A federal corporation. When did this happen? Well, it's the Act of 1871. It says, Be it enacted by the State and House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled, that all that part of the territory of the United States included within the limits of the District of Columbia be and the same is hereby created into government by the name of the District of Columbia. Wasn't it already the government? By 1871? What are they doing? By which name it is hereby constituted a body corporate for municipal purposes and may contract and be contracted with sue and be sued sounds a lot like a person doesn't it plead and be impleaded have a seal and exercise all other powers of a municipal corporation not inconsistent with the constitution so this what is, happened in 1871 to bring this in well this is right after the civil war oh. <laughs> our government reacts to the people that we shouldn't be mad at them. They're just God's letting the government go the direction it needs to go because of our disobedience. So how did this happen? That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. We consented. That's how it happened. We volunteered for it. Okay, the United States Constitution says under uh, Article 1, Section 10, no state shall pass any bill or law impairing the obligation of contracts. That's why our government say this is not unconstitutional when we see all these unconstitutional things. Because the Constitution doesn't impair our right to contract. We can contract into any law we want. And if we contract into a different law, the judge is going to judge you based on that law. And we're going to go in there and say, oh, that's unconstitutional. He's going to say, that's not unconstitutional. You, you, you can contract into whatever you want. This is the law the people enact. Uh, in fact, it's God's word. God says, when you vow a vow, you shall not slack to pay it. Thou shalt keep and perform even a free will offering according as thou hast vowed. We're supposed to, God expects us to keep our vows. And put it in modern vernacular, you made your bed, now lie in it. You know, this is, this is what you created, you got, you got to deal with it. And that's where we're at in America. And we've all done that. Every single one of us in this room has done this. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. How do we make a covenant with a god? Well, all, all government regulation in America is volunteered for by contract. Social Security, if you sign up for Social Security, you're not under the Constitution. You're going to court for the Social Security law now. Yet we get mad and try to argue the Constitution for some reason. Incorporation, licenses, birth certificates, all these things are contracts we signed that change the law that governs us. So what was Washington, D.C. before 1871? Well, the United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 8 says, The Congress shall have power to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10, uh, 10 square miles. So they have uh, governing authority over those 10 square miles. 
as may by session of particular states and the acceptance of Congress become the seat of the government of the United States and to exercise like authority over all places purchased by consent of the legislature. Do you see anything about incorporation in our Constitution? It was the government. The difference we are doing now is we have a government based on graven images now. We've signed them up as a corporation and we're bowing down to those images and they're, they're, they're changing our laws. That is the problem. I, I am, it's hard to accept the first time, but I am convinced that this is what the scripture is talking about. We got to look at a culture from thousands of years ago and compare it to what's happening today. It looks different, but it's really the same thing. There's no difference. It's the government changing our laws. But it's based on what we do. We consent. So government incorporation. The federal government is incorporated. States are incorporated. All 50 states are now incorporated. Most cities are incorporated. Some are not. I actually live in an unincorporated city and I love it because there's more freedom. But I still have the the, the laws of the state to follow and the laws of the uh, federal government to follow but there's no extra laws from my city added to it we're under county jurisdiction our county's probably incorporated I don't know if that makes sense but do you see where we're at now all right on the public you shall not make any graven images. The law is to be revealed to the people. It is not to be kept secret. God command that we keep His law not secret. Okay? We kind of do that today. That they may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken. That's what the Levites do. We call that case law today. If you, if you want to see how the law is construed, every court case, the judge writes up his opinion and he puts it on file and you can read it anytime you want. God told us to learn from our judicial system, our Levites, and we don't want to listen. We never want to read what they say and try and understand the state of the law in America. But that's, just, that, that's what it is. They're telling us how the law works. And the law of our land is the common one. You guys saw that that's the Torah. The law is to be publicly written so that everybody can see. It was given to the Levites and it was written, uh, uh, this law, and it was written very plainly so that people could understand. The law is to be publicly read to remind the people that it, it is to be followed. Every seven years at the Feast of Tabernacles, we're supposed to read it and teach it so that everybody knows. I wish our government did that. Wouldn't it be awesome if the government was showing this to everybody seven, every seven years? The Ten Commandments are to be written on your doors and gates. That's my favorite one. It's very personal to Rochelle and I. Because when we learned that we're supposed to keep the commandments, the first thing we found was that one. So we immediately went online and Googled for Ten Commandments. We put them out on our lawn and put them on our door. So this one holds a special place in my heart. But what, what, what boggles my mind is what the Jews do with the mezuzah. They put it and they hide it in the door frame so no one can see it. That totally defeats the purpose. You know, I want to find as big a Ten Commandments as I can get and put it out on my lawn so everybody can see. It, it never made sense to me. I just, it just baffled me to read that, to, to see how they uh, construed that law. The law is to be taught and instructed privately. That's to our children. And then there's appearance. You shall wash your clothes and yourselves when in the presence of God. We might call that church clothes today. You know, when we're in the presence of God, when we're going to church and serve, we should look decent. I, I think that's what God means by this. We should look decent. Let them wash their clothes before they approach the Lord. Um, Cross-dressing is forbidden. The woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. Okay, I like that law. That makes me feel very comfortable. <laughs> Here's one that's a little controversial. Men may not shave the, the hair off the sides of their head or their beard. Ooh. I'm, I'm going to explain it and understand there's, there's, there's no judgment on my part on this because it, it's kind of personal. But corners, it means an extremity, a cornered end or a side. Round means to strike with more or less violence, to cut down. That's how it's translated, to cut, cut down. We are not to cut the sides of the hair on our heads, so we're not to trim the sides of our hair. And mar means to batter, to cast off, to ruin. We are not to cut the sides of our beard. Okay? Th these are very popular today. That's why I say it might be offensive. Um, I think this is an image of God's statute. 
We are made after His image. Okay? The spirit of that law today, the way I look at it, we should be well-groomed. After all, we are created in God's image. We should not try to distort that image. So what I honestly think this is talking about is when we go crazy with our hair and change it up, we should just be groomed, neat, and normal. Now obviously, I don't have a beard. I don't think this means you can't cut your beard. I think it means you can't shave it in different directions. Now, you'll find different interpretations. If you don't like mine, that's okay. That's the way I see it. And understand, this is not one of those commandments that I would make a big deal about. But it's in the scriptures. So, most people go to the Egyptians. They had that long goatee that they'd wear. And I don't like doing that where God would say, I don't like this because they're doing it that way and they're pagans. I like to put it as in, we're made in God's image as a general like that. Let's look the way God intended us to look. And that's just the way I look at it. But, you know, this is very controversial. There's a lot of different opinions about it. I apologize if that's offensive to you. But um, it, that's the way I see it. Oh, well. Well, <laughs> what are you going to do? I, I wanted to go through all the commandments in a study, and this is the way it goes. Um, you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. We're doing that a lot today. Okay. Tattoos and piercings all over the place. I'm a public school teacher. I see it in kids 12 years old. And it's like, what are you doing? I don't, I don't understand it. But again, I say it's the same thing. The appearance, we're, we're made in God's image. You know, we should respect that. I don't know if, if your mind ever gets that way, but we should respect that. And, um, you know, you can just see the direction a nation goes by some of these statutes, where the people are going. Uh, some people get caught up on the for the dead part, as if you shouldn't do any cuttings only for the dead, but it's okay to do it for anything else. I think that just happened to be the most common thing that they did. So that's why it's worded that way. But I think the implication is, you know, just anything. But again, that's, that's controversial as well. Don't take it too personal. You can find a different understanding if you don't like that one. Well, and it was, it's talked about that the body is God, it's temple God's temple. And all that is is just mutilating what belongs to God. No, it, that's, that's exactly the way I look at it. But, you know, some people have said that means you can't shave your beard. But I'm obviously clean shaven. I don't think it means that. What I think it means is you can cut your beard off or you can grow a beard. But trying to shape and make it different, um, that's the way I get it just from looking at the scripture when it says the sides. and uh, if, you put, if you put a face up there and you start trying to draw and, and cut and do like it's describing, that's what you get, you know, in, in my opinion. So that, that's the way I taught it. Uh, but again, there are some, this is what I always tell people. The New Covenant says God's writing His law in our hearts. If you're not convicted about something, that means he's not writing it there yet. Don't worry about it. The only ones I'd be worried about are the ones that affect someone else, that cause a damage to someone else. That's the only one I'm going to call anybody on. But, uh, so if, if this doesn't bother you, don't worry about it. Some of these commandments are very difficult to accept at first. Please keep in mind that God has grace. If anyone's violated any of God's commandments, especially one that cannot be undone, such as tattoos, God provides grace. In fact, this might be that thorn in the flesh as Paul spoke of, to remind you of that grace for the rest of your life. You may not wear mixed fabric clothing, and I have a different opinion on this than most, but it's not necessarily offensive. If you've heard of Curlian photography, it measures the electrical field of an object. Vibrational energy affects this electrical field. Did you guys know we have an electrical field? Everybody's electrical field varies. Uh, vibrational energy affects this electrical field. Here's the difference. If you look at a cooked tomato versus a raw tomato, you can see curly in photography shows you their electrical field. The cooked tomato has been damaged. In 2003, Heidi Yellen did a study. She studied the human body, or she studied these electrical fields and came up with that the human body has a signature frequency of about 100. So somewhere around 100 is where our frequency should be. When our clothing is below 100, it damages our frequency. So if our clothing is below 100, like say 50 or 25, it's going to hurt our electrical field. This is a science we haven't studied much yet, so just bear with me for a minute. Synthetic fibers. 
polyester, nylon, these synthetic fibers, they're less than 100 every time. So you're going to hurt your electrical field every single time. Organic fibers are over 100. So if you're wearing an organic fiber, you know, cotton or something like that, you're over 100, so you're helping yourself out. Mixed fabric. Anytime you mix any fabric, zeroes it out. So I understand this. It says, thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts such as woolen and linen. It's giving woolen and, wool and linen as the example because it's the most important one because they have the highest frequency. But I think it applies to all. So if you take anything, I mean, if you think about America 100 years ago, everything was 100%. And you think about the way nations go, we're going away from God's law. Now all you find is mixed fabric. Rochelle and I have been working at getting to 100%. We always check the tag to make sure it says 100% every time. It's easy for a guy. It's really hard for women. It took her a lot longer to get to 100%. She, I think most of our clothes is all 100% right now. And uh, we do that. We think this is a health statute. Then I was going to show you wool and linen. They both have a frequency of 5,000. Do you see how that's a lot higher than our normal body frequency? It's used for the priesthood. And remember, the priesthood deal with the sick. A frequency like wool and linen will help you when it comes to your immune system and your healing capabilities. It should be used for healing today, I think. If you're having some sort of an illness, you know, having a garment of linen or wool would be great to have. Do I think it's something we should wear every day? Well, you can. It's probably hard to find something all linen or make your whole wardrobe all linen. I know Chauncey's got a neat little white linen suit. But um, that's what I think this statute means. 100% fabric. But I also wonder, as I was reading her study, I wonder if I'm wearing mixed fabric every day, right. is mine going to be a lot less than someone who, is mine consistently going to be less? Right. I don't know. And obviously, we don't know much about our electrical field. Right. The science hasn't studied it much, but I would connect that maybe to diseases like Parkinson or neurological diseases, right. stuff like that. It just, it just makes sense. But there's literally no science to support one way or the other. I'm guessing it's probably a health statute. Everybody has about approximately 10,000 volts of static electricity going through the body at any given time. When you diminish that electricity in any way, shape, or form, that electricity is the same electricity that's moving your thoughts. It's the same electricity that's moving your muscles that your body controls on. If you lose your electricity, you die. Yeah. It's probably the same line of thinking with the reflexology and right. the oils. Things are traveling through your body, and we don't understand it today. I think they did back then. We always give these guys credit thousands of years ago, like they're not very bright. But I think in many ways they were smarter than There's us. A lot of technology that got lost. In many ways. You look at the pyramids, how they move those stones, and we can't even do it today. Yeah. They weren't as dumb as we think. The fringe statue. This is the last one that might be... A, I, this one's not offensive, but my opinion's a little different. You shall make fringes in the borders of your garment. Okay? Strong's Dictionary. Quarters. It's an edge or extremity. So the edges of your garment, you're to make fringes. Fringe, it's the Hebrew word gadil. You notice how that's not the word zitzit. This is not a zitzit. In the sense of a twisting, it's a tassel or festoon. The context of Deuteronomy 22. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but the first part is taking care of animals. It's a business statute. Then there's animal preservation, another business statute. Then there's negligence, more business statutes. Farming more business statutes, and then all of a sudden there's this weird religious one about putting fringes on your clothing. I don't know if you see where I'm getting at, but I think this is a business statute. Here's why. The only other place this word is in the scripture calls it a chain work of wreaths. It's a chain, a woven chain work of wreath wrapping around something. Here's an ancient picture of the Hebrews, and they had their Fringes wrapping all the way around their garments. If you think of how you find fabric, if you don't put a fringe on it, it's going to fray and fall apart. This makes it fit with all those other business statutes if you look at it as a business statute. God said to put a fringe around the edges of your garment because it's just good clothing manufacturing. This would be a fringe, although it's not as decorative, but that's a fringe. 
This is a fringe. These are fringes woven to hold the shirt together so it doesn't fall apart. Is that like serging? What's that? Like a serger? I didn't hear. Like a serger? Like a serger? It, you're probably talking sewing terminology, yeah. and I don't know sewing terminology. Yeah. Okay, it, yeah, I, I think it's talking about hemming, yeah. which is why in the New Testament it talks about the hem. It's translated hem. The Greek word that was used for this one in the Septuagint is translated hem when they talk about touching the Messiah's garment. Okay, there's a second one, I think. You shall place a ribbon of blue within the fringe. Numbers 15 has a totally different context. This is the word zitzit, speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the border of their garment. Borders is the same word, it's an edge or an extremity, it's something on the edge. Fringe is a floral or wing-like projection, a tassel or a lock of hair. The context of Numbers 14 through 15. Israel murmured against Moses, so they argued with Moses. Didn't like being in the wilderness. Israel wanted to stone Moses. So they were getting ready to kill Moses. God wanted to judge the people. He was going to strike them all dead. Just wipe them out. But Moses pleaded for him, And God said, I have pardoned according to your word, Moses. So you can sense God was disappointed. God gave Israel 40 years of wandering instead. So instead of wiping them out, God got soft and only gave them 40 years of wandering. Israel was defeated by the Canaanites. Then God explains the sacrificial system in Numbers 15. Numbers 15, 1 through 31 goes over the sacrificial system. Remember what we went over? It's a judicial system. It's a judgment. It's a judicial system. They find a man working on the Sabbath. And Moses judges him harshly and they stone him. And then God talks about tzitzit. God commands the fringes with the blue thread right after that stoning. This is not a basic clothing statute. Let's read, I'm going to read this twice and I'm going to put a different emphasis. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments. The word for fringes is zitzit. It's a different word than, than, than the other place. Fringes in the borders of their garment throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue, and it shall be unto you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart and after your own eyes, after which you used to go a whoring. Here's the next one. All the blue is plural, all the red is singular. And the Lord spake unto Moses, he's speaking to Moses by himself, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, them, and bid them, the children of Israel, that they make them, the children of Israel, are to make fringes in the borders of their garments. The children of Israel are to do it, not Moses, the children of Israel. In the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they, the children of Israel, put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue, and it shall be to you, singular Moses, you Moses, for a fringe that you, singular Moses, may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them in judgment when you're judging the children of Israel, because you didn't do it in Numbers 14. And do them, and that ye shall seek, ye singular shall seek, not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye used to go a horn. If you look at it from singular and plural, I think you get a little different understanding. Let's put these two together real quick, just to understand, okay? We're to fringe the edges of our garments. That's, I think that's just a business statute. It's just good clothing manufacturer. It's right in the business chapter of the Bible. It fits contextually. But we're supposed to put a blue fringe or a tassel for a certain reason. What are tassels for when it comes to the judicial system? The fringe is the gadel, that's to hem up the edges of a garment. The tassels a zitzit to remind our judges to keep God's commands. Tassels in court, did you know that tassels have a history in court? Look at our flag. That's our United States flag. It's got red stripes, white stri uh, stripes, and, and blue, right? Red, white, and blue. Are there any other colors on the flag? Nope. Sure there are. If you go into a courtroom, do you see the different colors? Gold tassels on the U.S. flag. Oh. Gold tassels on the U.S. flag in court. 
Tassels represent the admiralty jurisdiction. Tassels in court have always meant the jurisdiction of the court. Okay, I've had a really hard time tracing this out and proving it, but if you Google tassels in court and lawyers and tassels and all this stuff, tassels are everywhere in court. I was just reading something a couple of days ago. Lawyers commonly like to wear the shoes with the tassels on them. They're constantly wearing tassels. Here's what I suspect. Blue tassels on a citizen in court is a way to remind the judge that I'm judged under God's law. And in my mind, it fits the context of Numbers 15. It makes perfect sense to me. It, it, it just fits. Um, is it easy to prove? I don't know. But Jesus gave us the example. He wore them on the Sabbath. Uh, he wore them on holy days. And I think he would have worn them whenever he went to the temple or the courtroom. And I'll be honest, I've done it twice as a juror. And I got out of jury duty each time. Um, I'm guessing... <laughs> I don't think it had anything to do with my tassels as much as some of the other things I was bringing up. Right. <laughs> they probably just didn't want me there because of what I was talking about. Who knows? But uh, I, I've always believed Psalm 111.10, a good understanding of all they have to do is commandments. I'm trying to do it the best I can. I started four years ago wearing them the best I could, and I change them all the time. Do I think everybody needs to wear them? Not really. I, think it's, I honestly think it's for court. Um, holy days, Sabbath days. Honestly, the, the fringe, we all do that anyways. Um, but I really think there's a connection here, but I haven't traced it as far as I had hoped. Did I was ever... really hoping to find the smoking gun on this, and I haven't found it. There's one in here that I wanted to touch on that people mi mix up. It says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine hearts, and you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. This is what the Pharisees wore on their head as a phylactery and they wore them on their arms also. I didn't put this in my code pleading of the Mosaic Law. Here's why. If you study them historically, you'll find out that they were not worn by the common people. It wasn't something that, that was done except by the Pharisees at the time of Christ. Um, Alfred Edersheim in the life and times of Jesus the Messiah said it was not quite universal. He was talking about how it's hard to find any evidence for anyone wearing them but the Pharisees. You don't hear of anything but them in the scriptures. And finally, this last one from Alfred Edersheim also said, It is remarkable that Aristides seems to speak only of the phylacteries on the arm, while Philo of those of the head, while the LXX, the, LXX, the Septuagint, takes the command entirely metaphorical. If you read the Septuagint, there's no way you would get this as a command. The words are clearly metaphorical. And here's what I think they mean. Um, the word lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul that's the same word if you take it literal you're supposed to cut your heart open and write them on your heart and on your soul somehow but the words always used the Greek word in the Septuagint is always used metaphorically so I think what these are saying is you shall bind them on your head that means your thoughts should be always on these and they should be put on your hand that means your actions should Show forth your thoughts. I don't think we need to wear things on our head, although there's probably nothing wrong with that, but I wanted to address that under the apparent statutes anyways. Uh, the last one, God charged man with the law, honor your father and your mother. Two quick statutes or titles to go under, family and education. Some of these are repetitive. Oh, there is one controversial thing here. Sorry, I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> Parents shall teach their children the law of God. If we were doing that, that's why this statute says, honor your father and mother. Why? So that you live long in the land. If every parent were educating their kids in God's law and teaching their kids how to educate their kids in God's law and that progression kept going, we would stay long and live very happily in this land. Children shall honor and fear their father and their mother. Those are the only God-given authorities we should fear. Where we're in the place of God to our kids. That's who we are to them. If a child is rebellious and will not respond to chastisement, he shall be put to death. This is juvenile delinquency. We get this mixed up a lot. The law of God, the father has property rights in his family. I don't know if you knew that, but the father is the patriarch. He's the head of the family. He bears all the burden. Father is solely responsible for all debts made by his family. This is Numbers 30, I think it is. If a child is rebellious and 
damages the neighbor property, injures the neighbor's family, or even murders a neighbor's family, guess who's responsible? The father is. This changes things. In Numbers chapter 30, it was Numbers 30, it talks about contracts and covenants and vows within the family and how the father can annul the daughters and all a whole bunch of different things. The bottom of the line is the father bears the iniquity. He's the one that bears the sin. The father, but then in the scriptures it also says, the father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. But this every man is talking about adults. So once that child reaches adulthood, now the father does not bear that burden. But when they're under that, which I think is the age of 20, the father bears that burden, which is what the scripture seems to point out. If you look at Exodus 21, 28 through 29, if an ox gore a man or a woman that they die, then the ox shall be surely stoned and his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be quit. But if the ox were wont to push with his horns in the past, and it hath been testified to his owner, and he has not kept him in, but that he has killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and who? The owner shall be stoned. Well, why would this not be true for your children? If you're being neglectful, for an animal, if you're being neglectable for your kids, why would it not be the same thing? I think that's what this statute means. If your child is a juvenile delinquent, you've, you need to take care of business. If, if they're out of control, it might require a death penalty. The father will always decide when to take the child to court to determine guilt. It's always a trial, and it's always before two or more witnesses. And, it must be and they must be found guilty. So there's, it's not like there's not going to be a trial. So let's read it. It says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son. See, we miss the context all the time. Stubborn and rebellious. Which will not obey the voice of his father. So he's not listening to his father. Or the voice of his mother. And that when they have cha chastened him, will not hearken unto them. So this is juvenile delinquency. He's, he's, almost, he's a lost case. Then his father and his mother shall lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, the elders of the city and the gate is where the judicial system was in all the cities. So he's going to court. This is our son. This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. Why? So shall thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. The whole point to this is that all of Israel learns. I guarantee you this has to happen once. And every kid in the land is going to recognize that they're going to obey their parents. We used to have public, public executions. You can find pictures online in America of a hanging, and hundreds of people from the town watching. Why? Because it teaches your kids and it teaches you, you better keep the commandments. You better keep God's law. He who strikes his father or mother shall be put to death. And he who curses his parents shall be put to death. This is also juvenile delinquency. The word for curse is to abate, make bright, bring into contempt, curse, or despise. It's translated as abate, which means hostile. This is someone who's hostile. The word curse isn't like we think where you're just swearing. The times when I was 10 and I swore at my mom or got mad wasn't for me to get stoned. This is serious stuff here. It's not just you know lighthearted things. And remember, the parents were the ones that took them to court. So... Who better to make that decision than the parents? It must have been dire, a dire situation before you'd make that decision. And if they were really good parents, the kid, so if they were really good parents and they're teaching this, and this kid's going astray, something is really messed up with the kid. Yeah. It, it's not just like he's mad that one day. I've only got two kids and they're young, but in the little time I've been raising them, I've learned they become what I teach them to become. It's very clear if you're strict and you discipline them, they'll turn. All their bad habits came from me. I mean, all their bad habits come straight from us. I mean, they're homeschooled, so they don't get a lot of outside. But it's very clear what I do is, is what they're going to come into. So it, the father needs to bear that burden. We need to teach and train our kids. You're very lucky. You're very fortunate. You're blessed. Whatever. <laughs> well, I'm a public school teacher, and I could tell you homeschooling is one of the best things for them. This is the controversial one. I apologize, and I'm almost done. You shall not pass your children through the fire to Moloch. 
I'm going to ask you guys to remember when we talked about the offerings, because it's important to understand the offering. Passing your seed through the fire to Molech. Seed represents your children. Molech is a ruler or a god. Right? Molech, that is king, the chief deity of the Ammonites. It comes from the word Melech, which is to reign, to ascend to the throne, to be king. Another way to put this is passing your seed through the fire to the king. Through the fire is a euphemism for contract. It's the burnt offering. It's for covenants and contracts. The burnt offering was given when God made covenant with Noah, when God made covenant with Abraham, when God made covenant with Israel. Every time a covenant is made, a burnt offering is given. This is a covenant offering. In the Abrahamic covenant, what did they do? When the Abrahamic covenant was ratified, God passed between the sacrifices. So he cut them in pieces, just like the burnt offering, and he passed through them. This was a custom used in making and confirming contracts. A calf or some other creature were cut in pieces. The burnt offering is the only offering that was cut in pieces. Just as God passed through the sacrifices to ratify a covenant, so passing your seed through the fire to Moloch ratifies a covenant. It, uh, this is what Shlomo gets, this, don't ask me to say his name, but uh, his comment on this is, it's a form of idolatry named Molech, and this was the manner of its worship, that one would hand over one's child to the pagan priests who would make two huge fires. The child was then passed through on foot between these two fires. The child wasn't injured. We keep thinking that it's child sacrifice, and that's not what passing your seed through the fire to Molech is. It is generally assumed that the child went through unscathed. That's what the Encyclopedia Biblica said about the passing your seed through the fire to Moloch. The child wasn't harmed. Rabbi Maimonides agrees that the children were not harmed when he said it was a light thing. He called it a light thing. It wasn't that big of a deal. So they didn't think much of it. It wasn't killing your child like we seem to think. Jephthah's vow? Was Jephthah really going to offer the next person that came out of his house to slit his throat, bleed him out, and burn him on the altar? Is that what he was going to do? Or are we misunderstanding that? He said, I will offer it up for a burnt offering. This is why Jephthah's vow was not child sacrifice. His daughter was dedicated in covenant to God, which means his daughter was leaving him to serve God. She was probably going to one of the gates of the city or to the temple or somewhere, one of the high places to serve the Lord. So she's not going to get married and bear children and have a family. And it, it was devastating to Jephthah. He didn't want that, but he wasn't going to kill her. This is the doctrine of parents patre today. Parents patre is Latin for parent of his or her country. The power of the state to act as guardian for those who are unable to care for themselves. Such as children or disabled individuals. For example, under this doctrine a judge may change custody, child support, or other rulings affecting a child's well-being. Regardless of what the parents may have agreed to. This is what we've done in America, you guys. It's called a birth certificate. A birth certificate is an adhesion contract. That's a standard form contract drafted by one party, usually a business with stronger bargaining power, and signed with the weaker party, that would be us, usually a consumer in need of goods, who must adhere to the contract and therefore does not have the power to negotiate or modify the terms of the contract. Hmm. By the common law, parental rights were vested in the father. The modern tendency, however, is towards the equalization of the rights of the father and the mother. This is evidenced by the adoption of statutes. What statutes is he talking about? How are we changing from a patriarchal family to a matriarchal family in America? Well, there's two big things. It's called a marriage contract, a marriage license, and a birth certificate. That's what we're doing. This is exactly what happened to Israel. We just use different terms today. Makes them joint guardians. So the conclusion... Getting a birth certificate for your child is what the Bible calls passing your seed through the fire to Moloch. It sounds horrible. We're not sacrificing your kids. But what it basically means when you get a birth certificate is the state is governing my child. They're in charge, which is why we don't have authority over our kids anymore. That's why we have to ask CPS and their permission to do things. If you didn't do that, CPS has no authority and you actually have authority over your kids. It, it, it's... It, it, you, you can Google it, look it up. It's just a fact. That's the truth. Now, what's the remedy for this? There is no remedy to the birth certificate. 
There is no fix except, well first, vows, we are to keep, God said that, you're to keep your vow. You sign up for it, that's, that's what you did, you got to do it. The state's not going to give your kid back. The state owns the kid. That's, that's just the way it works. You know, a kid without a birth certificate cannot go to public school. I don't know if you knew that, because the state will only educate their kids. That's the way they word it. They will only educate their kids. Take that literal, because they're not going to educate your kids or my kids. They're going to educate their kids. That's how it works. That's why they're collateral for the debt. Exactly. The solution, follow the agreement made and you will not have any problems. There are always ways of escape. The Apostle Paul said, hey, there's a way of escape for all temptation and trials. There are ways of escape that God has made for us to obey Him in these situations. If your child has a birth certificate and CPS is the governing authority, what the courts say happened is you said, I am incompetent to manage the affairs of my child. That's the literal wording. And you want the state to take over those affairs. That's the way the law is worded. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you homeschool. God leaves ways of escape in our laws so that we can still teach and train our kids. This, this contract is void at age 18. You know why? Because that child has to act upon it before, it's, before they're bound to it. So if, if a child is five and they have a birth certificate, no big deal. Once they're 18, the minute they sign up for Social Security or use that birth certificate, they're bound to it. Because you've got to rescind it at that point. And you can. It's possible to do. So yes? The tax code, people that um, write their children off have to have a Social Security number and register that. You, you don't get any tax breaks you with the child without a birth certificate. But at 18, for the child to be bound to it, they actually have to use it. So if the child chooses not to use it for their whole life, it's not activated for them as an adult. Because you, they, once they become of age, they actually have to use it. The problem is we all do. It's like Social Security. The minute I signed up for, my parents signed me up for Social Security. But once I applied for a job and filled it out, I'm bound to it. It's called the Doctrine of Latches. It comes from the Scripture. The Doctrine of Latches comes from Numbers 30. And it basically means you have to act in a timely manner. So what happens is, if I had a Social Security card and I didn't want it, when I turned 18, I need to go rescind it immediately. If I wait till I'm 30, having used it for 15, 20 years, and say, oh, I didn't know any better, it, it, it doesn't hold water in court. It's called the doctrine of latches. You need to act in a timely manner. So what, what a child would have to do is 18, rescission, write it up, send it to the courts, and take care of it immediately. Um, that's the way out. Um, whether someone feels the need to do that is up to them. Uh, it, it, it's kind of hard to live life without it today, but it's possible. Several people do it. There's, a, there's whole communities, the Amish do it. Um, they, they don't sign those contracts and they purposely avoid it, but you've got to live a very simple life. All right, we are almost done. <laughs> Education has four statutes. Children are to be educated in the law of God. We already covered that. That's a repeat. Children are to learn the stories and illustrations of the scriptures. So not only does it tell us to teach the, the laws, but we're to teach all the stories and illustrations. So he says, And thou they, mayest tell them in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt. We're also supposed to tell them of oh, the testimonies which were brought in Egypt also. Uh, we're all supposed to tell them of the feast and teach them about that as well throughout the scripture on the feast days. Uh, or the scriptures on the feast tell us to teach them of the feast and the stories. Um, why? Because these are a shadow of things to come. They teach us something. So we teach those feast days because they teach us something. You shall teach your children to fear the Lord. That means that they should see it in you. And they should see that you fear the Lord and teach them how to fear the Lord as well so that they, they have that desire to be obedient.